Hey guys, welcome back. I'm Joe Ellis, Olympus educator and wedding photographer from Dallas, Texas. And today I want to talk about taking your own family portrait. As we head into the holidays, I feel like this is a job we're all going to have. Let's get into it. Okay, so the same thing happens to me every year. I show up for Thanksgiving or Christmas or New Year's and all of my family's together and we all want to take a picture where all of us are in it. And so I feel like this is a job that every photographer gets conscripted into no matter what your genre is. You might spend 99% of the year taking pictures of lions in Africa. As soon as you get home, they want you to take a portrait. <laughs> so let's talk about a few tips I have since I've done a ton of these on how you can get better photographs and do this job even quicker. So my first tip is that always have a tripod somewhere in your kit, somewhere in your truck or your car, so that you always have access to it when you need to do this kind of job. Even if it's a cheapy tripod that you picked up from Walmart or it is like your old uh, junky tripod that broke down, having something with you at all times is a huge benefit. If you can't place the camera where you want it, you're gonna be severely limited in where you can place your people and what kind of light you're gonna have. So I always have something in my car just for these kinds of occasions so that I can get the picture that I want. The second tip is that if you are shooting these pictures for let's say a Christmas card or something like that, and you have an opportunity to swap sessions with another photographer, it really helps in terms of the variety of pictures you can make and having someone monitor what's going on to make sure that you get even better photographs. So before you do this yourselves, I think it's great to swap with somebody else. So those are my two sort of prerequisite statements there. But let's assume that we're all out together as a family sometime near the holidays, we're out looking at Christmas lights or something like that, and we wanna get a family portrait made. And so I'm gonna go ahead and use my uh, tripod and set it up so that I can be in the frame. So the first tip I have for you guys is you wanna set the focus and then put your camera into manual focus after you've already focused on the first person in the group. And the reason is this, if you are running back and forth to your camera to make sure you've got the right smiles and composition and lighting, and anything about you bumps the camera in terms of the shutter and the camera refocuses, you're gonna lose a whole bunch of frames before you realize what you've done. So the first thing I do is I will place the first person of my group into the picture. I'll focus on them, tell them to go ahead and please stay put for the duration of the pictures. And then when I put the camera into manual focus, it's essentially locked in that position. No matter what I do to the controls of the camera, as long as I don't change the focus ring, it's gonna stay put. And so that's a huge help and it saved a few headaches over the years when I've missed pictures because of autofocus issues. So put your camera in manual focus. Uh, I have my EM10 Mark III set up right here and I have a live feed going into the computer so that you guys can see uh, what the camera sees. And so if you've never done this before, just real quickly, if you have your camera in regular um, focus mode and then you go into uh, your super control panel. So normally I'd have it right here in SAF, go ahead and focus on my wife and then I would go ahead and hit OK, and then I would roll it over to manual focus. So I just went to the super control panel just real slowly, and those are the focus settings, and then over to manual focus. Uh, if you have one of the pro lenses and you're new to the system, the pro lenses have a focus clutch on them. So if you pull back on the focus um, uh, wheel or the focus control here on the lens, and you pull back on it, you put the camera into manual focus. Uh, and so this is a, a constant question you see on uh, forums and things as to why your camera won't focus is that it's been pushed into manual focus via the clutch. But in this case, that would be a huge benefit if you've already focused on your group. You could simply pull back on the barrel and then you'd have your camera in manual focus. That's for the pro lenses and some of the premium lenses have that focus clutch mechanism. If you have the, some of the other premium lenses like the 25 1.8 here, which is my favorite lens for shooting you know, family gatherings and things, you have to use the super control panel to put it into manual focus. Okay, so that's number one. Number two, there are three ways to trigger your camera uh, for like a self portrait situation. The first one is to use a self timer. And Olympus cameras have a variety of self timers. They have a two second self timer or a 12 second self timer. And then my favorite, the custom self timer mode. And so I just wanna show that to you guys in case you've never seen it before. The custom self timer allows you to define three things. How long until the first picture is made, how many pictures are made up to 10 and how much time there is between each frame from a half second on up. So if we go into um, our super control panel again and we go down to our drive settings, the one we're looking for is marked sort of timer icon C for custom self timer. 
So what you might be normally seeing all the time is that you're in anti-shock or you're in single. If you go all the way to the other end of the spectrum here, all the way to the other side, you'll see C and then anti-shock C. I use anti-shock in most of my cameras most of the time, so I'll go ahead and use that now. If I press OK, or press Info, I'm sorry, then I can define my custom mode. Oops, <laughs> hold on. So OK, and then go to C, and then press Info, and I should be able to change each of the parameters. So like I said, the first one, timer, that's how long until the first frame. Uh, the second one is marked number of frames. That's how many frames it'll take. And the third one is how long between each frame. So if I go ahead and choose that now and I were to hit the button to start the process, it would wait 10 seconds. It would take 10 frames in a row with a half a second uh, between each frame. Pro tip here. If you are using a strobe for your family portrait and you only give the flash um, a half a second between frames and you shoot 10 frames in a row, there's a possibility if you're running the strobe at full power or close to full power, you might not get uh, the flash to fire on every single frame. So if you're doing that, you might want to increase the time between frames to make sure you get good exposures on every single one. Okay, now all that being said, if that's the best mode that you have and that's the one you like best, that's awesome. But the one that I use more often is that I use the OI Share app on my phone to trigger the camera. And the reason is that if I am in the picture, I can now coach people from my position to get good expressions. So it might be one, two, three, smile, or whatever it might be. If I can coach them into that moment, I'm gonna get more participation, I'm gonna get more people looking at the camera and doing the right thing at the right time. So um, if you have trouble with people trying to hold still for 10 seconds, if you have kids or things like that where you're trying to um, you know, get everybody doing the right thing at the right time, sometimes using the, the OI Share app in the trigger mode it just allows you to kind of have them uh, you know, know exactly when the picture's about to come and have everybody's energy be up at the same time. So to get to um, this mode, the one I like called the trigger mode, and have it be the, um, the big uh, button in terms of firing the camera, is that you need to go, uh, go ahead and turn on the Wi-Fi in your camera. So I have on one of my other cameras here, I have an EM1X, and I've turned on the Wi-Fi. And then if I go to my phone and open it, you can see that it's already chosen my EM1X. And if I go to OI Share, now you have the remote control option at the top of OI Share. Now, if you go into this mode and what you see is a live view coming out of the camera, then you need to change it to trigger mode. So right here at the top of the frame in your OI Share app is this little gear icon. If you tap that and you go to remote control and you see mode, then you can actually go in there and choose whether you're going to see the live view from the camera if you're gonna use the remote shutter option. The remote shutter option is the one that makes the most sense to me most of the time. So if you choose remote shutter, what you get when you go into this by going into remote control here at the top is you get a big button and the button fires the camera. And this just allows you very simply to trigger the camera as many times as you want. No muss, no fuss, no latency issues, no having to worry about looking at the, even looking at the phone to trigger it. You can do this from, you know, out of frame, at, you know, behind somebody's back and you can be triggering the camera. So uh, the default when you first turn the app on is to have the live view showing, which is great for a lot of applications. But for me, if I'm doing this kind of family portrait and I'm gonna be in the frame, I would much rather be using the remote shutter option. So just one more time, if you're on the home screen, go to the gear icon, go to remote control, and then go to mode. And you can choose between live view and remote shutter. If you want that big trigger button on your screen, then you want the remote shutter option. Okay, the third way to trigger your camera for this kind of um, shoot would be to use the time-lapse feature in your Olympus camera. And I use this um, only in one sort of specific scenario for, for family photos, and that is that if I want my family to be far away from the camera, like if we're going to you know, walk 10, 20, 30, 40, or 50 yards plus away from the camera, and we're gonna shoot a big scenic where we're gonna be small in the frame, then uh, this is a great option. You set up the time lapse to take, you know, maybe two or three or four minutes of pictures. It allows you to get there, do the poses that you guys might wanna do, and then come back and have a variety of uh, options for your, for your portrait. So to just set up a time lapse in your EM10 Mark III, I'll show you real quick. If you go to um, menu, and you go to um, camera two, 
this is the second menu down, you'll see time lapse is an option. What you want to do is go ahead and turn that on. Okay, and then when you're on it, you want to scroll to the right. And now you'll be taken to a screen that's very self-explanatory in terms of what's going to happen. But you can choose the number of frames, the start time for how long it takes before it takes the first one, and what duration there is between the frames. So in this case, I could take 50 frames, I could uh, have them one second apart, and that means that I'm taking about a minute of photographs, and I have 10 seconds to get in place. So if I'm going to be only, you know, 50 feet away, that's going to work fine. If I'm going to be, you know, a half a mile away, then I, you know, I need to take, you know, hundreds of more photographs so that I have more time to get in place. So um, this works really great. You know, if you're in a very scenic area, you can set up your tripod on a, a cliffside and run around and get on the point and then have you guys be small in the frame. So um, that works awesome. And that's the uh, time lapse feature in your OMD camera for taking a family portrait. Okay. So the third piece of advice I have out of five today is that um, all of that being said, because I do want to get it right in camera, one of the things that I do just to um, cover myself is that before I do any of this, I will take a series of photographs from behind the camera and make sure as I'm moving through the crowd that I watch each person as I'm taking some pictures and I get a good smile out of every single person. That way, if worst case scenario, I have to, I can do a face swap in Photoshop and I can have everybody giving me a good expression. And that just makes sure that I'm, I'm going to have a winner. So that's just a pro tip there for making sure that you deliver the goods. If you, especially if you have kids, take a minute, shoot a bunch of pictures of them in position, making sure you've got a good smile out of everyone. And then if you have to, you can put them together and make a perfect frame. Okay, number four, my advice on clothing. So my advice on clothing is this, uh, pick two colors um, and make sure that they are complementary. And if you don't know what I mean by complementary, think about your favorite sports team and what their color combos are. Um, that's a great place to start. Uh, almost every NFL team and every NBA team has a pair of colors and those colors tend to work well together. Once you have pick and you pick two colors that you think go well together, let people in the group wear any shade of those two colors in any combination that they want. And it will add a great deal of depth and texture to what you're doing. You do not typically in my mind want everybody wearing the same thing or the same color. It looks much better and more dynamic if they're all in the same color family and they're all wearing something that's custom to them rather than trying to shoehorn everybody into doing the exact same thing. So nice texture, dimension to your photographs, a lot of interest there if you pick two colors that you like and let everybody kind of go wild with it. When they're getting dressed, I always tell people that you want to go slightly more dressy rather than slightly less dressy. So, you know, you want something not, you don't want to go usually all the way up to suits and ties and dresses unless that's what you want to do. Um, but you also don't want it to be a typical uh, you know, Saturday afternoon outfit either. So it's a little bit, you know, dressier than normal works best. I find that it makes the, everyone feel good about the photograph and give it sort of extra legs in terms of its use and longevity in your family. Um, and then the third piece is that um, I want everyone to consider what they're wearing and make sure that it doesn't wrinkle too much. If they pick clothes that wrinkle really easily and they are out and about, you know, at the family gathering for a period of time before you take the photograph, and they come into the picture with a ton of wrinkles, you can take them out in Photoshop. It does take quite a bit of work. And um, in my mind, it's better to have them bring something that they love and change into it right before the photograph than it is to deal with that in post. <clears throat> okay, so the fifth thing we're gonna talk about today is finding the right spot. So the first thing that you have to consider when you're out finding a spot for a big family portrait is that you need to look at the lighting. And I'll be honest with you, even as a pro, my first preference for lighting is very simple, and that is to go ahead and use backlight. So I want the sun um, shining on everybody's backs so that each of their faces is getting indirect light from the environment around them. And that works really well at making sure that the lighting is even, that there aren't any harsh shadows on people, and that everybody generally looks good. It's really simple for me to add fill flash or even main light flash to a backlit scenario rather than having to deal with balancing light coming from the side or the top or the front. 
if I have a small group, like of four people or two people, then I'm way more than willing to um, experiment with side lighting and front lighting and all kinds of other things. But if it's a big group, I don't think that um, getting too fancy with that kind of thing or taking that risk of having one person wind up with ugly sunlight on their face um, is worth it. So I'm gonna go out, let's say in my parents' backyard, and I'm going to choose the direction in which would put everybody with the sun to their backs. Then I start thinking about posing. And here's my simple rule on posing a big group. I want about a third of the people at the top standing, about a third of the people sitting high or leaning, and then I want about a third of the people sitting all the way down. So that could be uh, ground, chair, stand, or it could be stand, sit on the edge of the chair, and then sitting in the chair, and then on the ground. You know, you can do all kinds of different combinations. If you had a series of rocks, you could have people standing, sitting, and that kind of thing. Just to make sure you're getting at least three different head heights in a big group, and that you're doing a lot of variation of that. It will fill the frame with faces rather than just legs and arms and feet. And uh, it makes a much more dynamic looking portrait. I am not particularly concerned with everybody being symmetrical. Um, and when it comes to kids, you know, the typical thing is to go ahead and put them all at the bottom of the frame, like sitting at the, in a row in front of the grandparents, for example. And that looks fine, but if you put the kids standing in chairs or standing on tabletops or on somebody's shoulders or any variation of things, it just adds interest to the picture and also looks a little bit more, um, you know, polished than it does to kind of do the very perfunctory, you know, this is where everybody normally stands type of pose. So if you can find a location where you can vary head heights, even if you need to drag some chairs over from another area, then you have got yourself a very dynamic family portrait. So um, that's my tip on posing. All right, so my bonus tip for you guys is that um, if you guys are out doing a family portrait, maybe it's just the four of you and you are trying to shoot your Christmas card. If you are out in that scenario, I think it's also really important to take the time to go ahead and shoot all the different combinations of people that you can. So like if it's my family where we have um, one son and one daughter, my wife and I, then I'm gonna do us boys, me and my, then I'll do me and my daughter, I'll do me and my wife, and we'll do the same set for her. We'll do the kids together, we'll do us together, we'll do the four of us together. And by doing all those different combinations, um, including individuals of the kids, for example, then I have a great collection of photographs from which to design with. And um, that can make things a lot easier when you're, um, let's say, putting together a Christmas card or a collection of pictures for a wall or for an album. So um, take the time to do that. Uh, you know, most of the time, the tendency is to want to run around and do basically the same photograph in seven or eight different locations. So like I'm gonna shoot the four of us and we're gonna get seven different options of the four of us. I would much rather have a stay in one location and get all those different combinations of people than I would to worry about having to move the group around. And if you are lucky enough to be in a big family or to shoot a big family portrait, you wouldn't believe how much people would appreciate getting some of those different combinations that they don't typically get um, each year. So definitely take the time to do that. So. That's what I've got today, guys. Um, hopefully you guys um, are be doing this together with me as we head into the holidays. If you have any questions or uh, things you wanna talk about in the comments, I'm happy to do that with you. And uh, tomorrow I'll be talking about um, you know, doing prints for people for Christmas gifts. Um, instead of doing, um, you know, like what are the top techie gifts to give people um, this week, I wanna talk about um, how we can do some homemade stuff in terms of making prints and albums and cards and things like that uh, from our photography. Since sharing our work is one of the best parts about being a photographer. So uh, good to talk to you guys. Thanks for watching. If you, um, you know, haven't yet, please subscribe and leave a comment. I'll see you guys there. Thanks so much. I'll see you all in the next one. <music>